All right, great. Um, my name is Charles Eisenstein. I'm going to talk about, well, I'll, I'll begin by talking and then we'll go somewhere else. Um, but I, I'm going to talk about deschooling yourself, releasing the unconscious habits of school. Because a lot of us are uh, pioneering new ways of, of learning, teaching, education, um, and new ways of relating between adults and children. I mean, that's really the most general uh, formulation of school, uh, a way for children and adults to relate. And we're trying to do it in a new way. And a lot of us have an intellectual understanding of, of what that is. We may not all agree on it exactly, but we have an intellectual understanding of what we want to do and what we don't want to do. But sometimes, I've noticed, at least in my own experience with this, that I have unconscious habits, unconscious ways of being, thinking, and speaking that perpetuate the old system, even though in my mind I believe myself committed to something new. So I'm thinking about the new but still living in the old. And these, these habits of thinking, speaking, and being have gradually come to light uh, for me over a period of years. And I expect that there's still many ways in which I'm still very much a schoolboy or a schooled boy and that there are many uh, ways that I'm still in the process of discovering or still yet to discover. So I'm hoping that some of these will come to light for me in this, in this workshop today. And perhaps all of you too, some of you might have awakened to your own internalized schooling in different ways than I have. And so maybe some of what comes out here will be new for you also. Because we all really, I think, in pioneering this new age, we need help from each other, from other pioneers, as we explore the invisible paths of the new world. Now, the, the, the things that I'm about to talk about, the habits of school, they're not just of school. They're not, if, even if you were homeschooled or unschooled or went to a, a free school, you're probably still not completely free of them because they permeate our civilization. They permeate our culture and our civilization on a very deep level. School isn't something separate from the rest of the grand enterprise of social engineering. World domination. Yeah, of world domination. Um, it's, it, it, it fits in uh, as an integral part of the system that we've created. It is an intensification of trends of management and control that have been going on for thousands of years. So it's not just, what we're going to talk about isn't just what happens in school and if you didn't go to school you'll be free of it, but it's something that school is especially designed to, to drill in to our habits of being. And a lot of what happens in school we internalize as adults. The ways that we related to teacher and to parents, of course, but this, that's not what this particular seminar is about, but the ways that we relate to teacher and to authority in general. I mean, school is really our first experience of an authority outside the family. And so the way that we relate to this authority, eventually we grow up and we relate the same way to an internalized teacher, an internalized authority. And we no longer need the external controls, the external rewards and incentives and punishments and threats. When that happens, we are considered educated. We are considered mature. Matures, and, and we get a document to certify that we are, that we have learned the lessons of school, that we have internalized these programs that are now of self-control, and we can be counted on to be compliant. That certificate is called a, a degree. Um, and if you want to prove your exceptional submissiveness and compliance, then you can get a graduate degree <laughs> or a PhD. Okay, so I just, without any further ado, I'd like to just begin uh, a big list of 
the habits of school, the unconscious, well, for some of you it will be unconscious, for some of us conscious, for most of us probably half conscious, but the habits of school, things that you learn in school, I'm just going to start off the list um, with a few examples. For example, here's one that's very apropos, the current setting, um, being on time. Okay. Punctuality. Right. Punctuality, being on time. Okay, or more generally, being on a schedule. Oh, and by the way, though, every habit, almost every habit of compliance that we learn in school has, has a mirror image. Okay. Which would be a reflexive rejection of it. Defiance. There's habits of submission and habits of defiance. So the habit of defiance would be um, being defiantly late all the time. Because, you know, you got you got one way that, that, I mean, rebellion, like reflexive automatic rebellion is itself a habit of slavery. Okay, so this would be um, being on time, never on time. <laughs> Okay, um, another example is um, dutifully doing your assignments, being, being dutiful. Boy, it's just not dutiful and industrious in the work assigned to you. Okay, and then another habit of school would be laziness, which is uh, a natural quality of slaves and people who have, who, who have been slaves, if you can't rebel outright, if that is futile, then you rebel by pretending to be lazy and stupid. Hence, a lot of the, the I mean, that's what people believed of, of the African Americans. They believed that, well, they're lazy and stupid, but that was really a form of unconscious rebellion when overt rebellion was a little bit too dangerous. And that's, what's, that's what some of us do in school, too. We pretend to be lazy and stupid so we can get out of doing things that we don't really want to do. Okay, so then, lazy. Okay, and so I just want to open it up, call out some uh, habits of school. Getting permission. Getting permission, yep, yeah. <laughs> yep, <laughs> raising your hand, I knew that was going to come up. Hmm. You know what, I'm just going to give up this board. Because, well, it's so nice to see them all here, but... Do you want to write it? Yeah, can someone else write it? That's a good idea. Chair, maybe? Yep. It keeps wiggling around. Yep, I can help hold it up. Okay. Right, so getting permission. That was halfway written. Good. Staying in your seat. With feet on your ground. Feet on the ground. Okay. Good. Because <laughs> I'm not doing it right now. The defiance. Yeah. Just call them out. Yeah. Uh, visual appearance. Visual appearance. Okay. Yeah. I mean, again, this isn't something that is completely restricted to school, but it's the crucible for for um, learning to appear acceptable, yeah. That you need other people to tell you what you need to know. Okay, right. Um, telling. Learning by being told. Being led. Intellectual dependence. Okay, being led. Yeah. Being led. Okay. Um, as opposed to dependence on authority, Reflexive distrust of authority. Yes, absolutely. That sounds like a reaction to something. What are you doing more about? Ref um, it's like the negative of the authority having. The authority. Right, reflexive distrust of authority. I mean, maybe in this world there is a proper place for authority, um, but if authority is abused, then a child naturally will. Some children will, will cow, will be cowed. Other children will 
be defiant and distrust all authority even if it's not improperly exercised. And this could be a philosophical conversation about is there ever a place for authority or leadership being led, right? But that's not what it's about right now. Right now we're just going to talk about the habitual aspect of it. Someone once described me as having a, um, in a situation where I was working in school, as having a um, me against the world attitude. Mm -hmm. Amen to that sister. A certain amount of, and I think that comes from having had to defend myself against the school situation where who yeah. I was was not okay. Right. But that defending doesn't, you know, now I'm an, an adult, do I need those defense mechanisms anymore? Right. Yep. I'd like to add one. Uh, wanting credit for being right. Say it again. Wanting credit for being right. Or just wanting to be right. Wanting to be acknowledged as right. Just credit or something specific, like a tangible reward. Acknowledgement for being right. So along with that, relying on somebody else to assess you know, performance. Mm -hmm. Achievement. Yep. Rankings. Right, rankings. Um, measuring up. How about measuring up? Do I measure up? Because in school you constantly are externally evaluated about whether you measure up, whether you make the standard. Um, even more now, of course, with No Child Left Behind than when I was a kid, but, but um, do I measure up? Do I measure up? The, the internalization of the external standards is Right, does this child measure up is the external aspect of it. When it gets internalized and becomes a habit, do I measure up? Okay, and does anyone, is anyone doing it right now? Notice right now what habits of school are operating. For example, are you evaluating whether you have these habits and giving yourself credit if you don't have them? And if you do have them, oh, you know, I flunked. Okay, and so we can see how deep this goes and the freedom that is available when we no longer are in the habits of school. Any others? Uh, well, what you were just talking about, if, you, if I raise my hand and I make a, a good point or a good question so that you write it down there and you say, oh, you're, that was a good point, and you're, yeah. giving, you're giving me this gold star. Right. So it sets up a situation where that kind of transaction Yes. Now, how would I respond to that in a way that doesn't reinforce the habits of school? Well, as, as the person who's facilitating this workshop, how can I right now act outside the habits of school and act to, to not reinforce them? You can talk on a very neutral thing, like that could be the philosophy for some people or not. Yeah. It gets all very But that's not how I would do it. I'd say, I'd say that's exciting for me. I'd say that, that point, I feel excited by that point. And but don't you think that's still kind of the same? I mean, people, people get a rev when they get okay. people excited. And well, right, but that's right. And that, so it, you could still, I mean, you can take anything and feed it through your own um, school filter, right? Teacher, uh, teacher getting excited, you can say, well, that counts as praise. And now Charles likes me because I made this point that feel, he feels excited about. And so wanting to be liked by authority. Competition. Mm -hmm. Competition, definitely a habit of school. Yes. Manipulation. Manipulation. By, by, by overt and covert means. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right, because kids are always trying to manipula manipulate the teacher. It's a constant program. When I was teaching, um, well, this came up a lot when I was teaching at Penn State for, a, a, I taught there for four years a while ago. And it was very rare, at least for the first part of the semester, that anyone was uh, genuine. Because there was this, you know, kind of background program of let's make the professor like me so I'll get a good grade. Let's make him think highly of me. Let's act in a way that shows that I'm smart. Okay, so publicly being smart, yeah. I would put onto the list. Wanting to be seen as smart. I noticed that a lot in, uh, 
well, sometimes live things, but also especially email forums of various sorts, where sometimes it seems like you know everyone is just competing to be publicly seen as smart and right. If you've ever seen, there's a, there's a shirt that says, somebody is wrong on the internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It strikes me that all of these characteristics are just as true with regard to how the administration treats the staff as staff treats students. Yeah. Great. yeah. So it's, it's inclusive. Yeah. It's Definitely. Yeah, and business too. Like Being dependent. Being dependent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dependent. Yep. Everything on. on on Gatto's list of the seven lessons of school um, is very deeply woven into this. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yes. That's a good one. I hadn't thought of that one. Yeah, not wanting to appear too keen. Right. You know, you don't, I mean, the other kids will make fun of you if you, if you like learning too much. Yeah. So cynicism. Cynicism. You know, not really believing fully in anything and not being too enthusiastic. Self-censorship, so you don't think too far outside the box. Mm -hmm. Self-censorship, yep, because you could get shot down. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to or being afraid to um, ask for help or kind of reflex of independence. Yes. Right, it could go both ways. Um, right, there's the dependency. Um, the dependency that, that a couple of people have mentioned, uh, intellectual dependency, you know, looking outside for the answers, and then, then the, the, uh, the, on the other side is, is I'm going to go it alone, I'm not going to get answers from anybody else, I'm going to do it myself, which is, again, not always appropriate or possible in this, in this world. Um, both of these habits keep us small. Mm hmm Dichotomous right and wrong. Definitely something we learn in school. Um, yeah, repressing emotions. Um, in the classroom and in the academic world in general, I mean, you're not supposed to get emotional if, 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 you, uh, <laughs> if you try to publish something in an academic journal. You know, it's not supposed to be emotional. It's supposed to be objective. So this is definitely a habit of suppressing emotions and sup suppressing subjectivity. And intuition. Suppressing intuition because you have to have a reason. You have to be able to pr produce a reason for things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, are you say, what are you saying about religion? Like excising it from... Um. Oh, okay. Hmm. So how can you sum that, sum that up in like three words? Adhering to higher values. Okay. Kind of, okay. I'm trying to think how that would be in public school, but there is kind of like this... The state and the government. And right. Civics being a good a good citizen and, and a productive, productive member of society and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Labeling. Labeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Labeling. And related to that, um, labeling knowledge and dividing, dividing the world into subjects. Okay, so in school, you know, you go from whatever, social studies to math to English to this to that. Disintegration. Disintegration. And then in life, it's like, well, I have different compartments of my life. I have my relationship, you know, I have my work, you know, I have my hobbies, I have this, I have that. This compartmentalized life, this kind of um, fragmentation perhaps didn't exist um, 10,000 years ago. And, and then related to that, mendacity, institutionalized lying, lack of honesty mm -hmm. on the part of individuals, 
permeates the whole thing. Okay, give me a give me a uh, give me a, a concrete example. Yeah. Um, like when the bureaucracy, you're working with people and nobody wants to work, step up above it because it makes everybody else look bad. Every you get slack for doing, mm -hmm. putting your full effort in because then everybody else is going to look bad for not putting their full effort in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not a perfect. <laughs> Um, from high levels of organizations, they will make pronouncements that after a while, everybody starts to recognize that it's never the truth. Yes. And, and but yet you just go with it anyway. So yes. The right. Exce there, so there's kind of this acceptable, there's this realm of acceptable discourse, acceptable questions, acceptable answers, acceptable opinions that everybody knows is not true. This is ubiquitous in our in our culture um, um, habitual and semi-conscious mendacity as you put it um, from everything from you know you, you drive around and look at the subdivision names you know walnut crossing there are no walnut trees and nor is there a crossing the, maybe they cut them down to build it but but often there there weren't even any to begin with you know Aspen Heights. Uh, no aspen trees there, and it's not even a heights, you know? It just sounded kind of British, you know, so they decided to name it that. Um, then you, Martin Luther King Jr. School it was a totally segregated school. Mm -hmm. Right. So invoking these, these symbols um, that have no necessary connection to reality. And we're so habituated to this that when politicians lie, we think nothing of it. Um, maybe some of you guys are exceptions, but people are not really shocked when, for example, this was a while ago, but George Bush, the elder, um, supposedly saw Independence Day, this movie that was kind of patriotic, and then um, a statement was issued about his opinions about the movie and how much he liked it. But this statement was written before he'd actually seen it by somebody else. And, and everybody in the press knew that. But nobody called him on it, and nobody really cared, and it just went out there as into to the, you know, and it's not just Republicans who do this. I want to add up there, feeling unsafe. Feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. That that affects, like right. why media, that's one of the reasons media might not stand up, is, you know, am I safe if I don't? Is it safe to speak up? Is it safe to be right? Right. Playing it safe, yeah. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. it's just it's a it's a lot. It's an emotional place. Right. right. It's Playing safe. it safe. And and okay, here's one of these unconscious habits that really was powerful in me. Okay, to make it personal, like I found that before I said anything, I would first calculate whether I would get approval and whether it was safe, whether it was it was acceptable. Um, given the role that I occupied in this big class. You know, there's different roles and different people can say different things. But I would have this kind of program running that would calculate everything based on how is somebody going to see me and how is somebody going to react to me if I say it this way. So I was not comfortable ever, 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 and not feeling free to just be myself and, to, yeah, put myself out there and if you don't like it, too bad. That's something you do not learn in school. Um, something that I've been working with for a few years is, is really um, valuing non-thinking work as a, as a working person. You know, I lived, worked in an office for a number of years and I felt like, well, I'm good, I'm important, I'm all this stuff. And I'm, you know, people are good, but I'm sort of like better or sort of like, you know, and now and I've not done that. And now I'm struggling, well, I'm, I'm just as good as everybody. I'm having this real shift in like perspective on, and it really has to do with old well, school education. You know, being smart and having a lot of knowledge is really valuable, and not have, you know, not showing or using that knowledge is you know my place is very different. I feel you know schooling is really like so valuable, and not having schooling and not using you know higher education in your work or in your life and you're not quite as valuable or, or, or you know I'm really I see, I'm seeing both I've been in both places and, whoa this is 
really impressive how strong that, that feeling is. Mm -hmm. It really is about school. Like, well, I'm, I got there. I'm, I'm just as good as everybody else. Or, you know, yeah. I mean, this whole thing that really sets, you know, school sets that up. In terms of the habit, yeah, it's the habit of being out of your body and keeping in it yourself. Right. That, uh, more broadly, it's, it's a habit of disassociation. Um, and that's a natural consequence of, of evaluation. Because to evaluate something, including yourself, you do have to step outside, which can be good, perhaps, um, when you do it consciously with intention. But when it becomes a habit, then you become disassociated from yourself, out of touch with your passions, your desires, your feelings, which is considered a good thing. Because how can you have a society where people do things that are degrading to human capacities or insulting to human nobility if you are in touch with your feelings and passions? You won't have people pushing mops all day or lying to customers all day or building weapons all day, probably. It's like schools foster celebrity. Pardon me? They foster celebrity. They, 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 they you know, teach that you know, you're valuable if you're a celebrity for some reason. They teach the famous people in mm -hmm. classes and mm -hmm. talk about the people who, who turn the wheels of society and make sure jobs are done. Mm -hmm. and emphasize that yeah. importance of that uh, contribution. Yeah. It's also in the school structure <coughs> in that, you know, the kids that are getting the great grades, the kids that are the great athletes, the ones, those are the sports stars. Those are, there's always that in the culture. And the folks in the shop doing the tech stuff in the shop. All those, you know, I grew up with that and, you know, it's just, is really hard to really but, value all, all the people. What were you going to say? You've had your hand up for a long time. Yeah, to add to what you were saying before, just being taught to value certain types of knowledge over others. Um, and then another thing is um, being in a highly structured environment and being expected to be told to do that. Yeah. Um, I, to me, that's a big one. For me, like, like the things that they teach explicitly, like about the great explorers and the great heroes and the movers and shakers, I think that's probably only about 5% of where we get the habits of school. The received ideology is less important than just the ways of doing things that are so routine that we think that that's just the way things are done. But one basic one is, what's my assignment? And we internalize that so deeply that people are very uncomfortable if there is no list of instructions here. Here's what you are to do. When I was teaching at Penn State, again, like if I gave an assignment and, and they're like, well, how many pages do you want us to write? And if I said, however long it takes to do it to your satisfaction, people were extremely uncomfortable with that because they've been habituated to fulfilling some requirements because you fulfill some requirements and you get your reward and if there are if there is no list of requirements to fulfill it's disorienting and so what kind of job and what kind of life is that tr a kind of training for so obviously quantity over quality, quality. Um, or or you could say um, fulfilling the letter of the requirements um, yeah, although a lot of times the intent is that you fulfill the letter of the requirements. Yeah. yeah. I think those are two different things. It really yeah. is a thing about quantity over quality. Yeah. And yeah, it's a different more thing. More pages counts more despite whatever the quality is. Right. The approach. Right. But, but more basically, it's just, you know, this desire to be told what to do. And then the opposite of it, of course, is is hostility, unthinking hostility to ever being told what to do. But you know what? Like, sometimes we need to be told what to do. At least that's what I've discovered in my, well, it's not good. That's what I've discovered in my life is that sometimes I truly need something from the outside. Mm-hmm. 
disregard for integrity or higher principles in favor of rules and procedures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. What do we mean when we say higher principles? That's a good question. Um, integrity makes a lot of sense to me. Higher principles sounds suspect. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that the assumption that there is a right and wrong way of doing it or the assumption mm -hmm. that someone knows better about someone else's process so that someone's reality is better than someone else's. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone's reality is better than someone else's. This is, yeah, get with the program. Mm -hmm. This. I know better than you when you only listen to me and abandon your indigenous way of doing it. Right. And my, my high principle is why I do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So being integrated to your own. To do it through an act of will, then he does somebody who naturally, and, and what school valorizes is mental activity, because there you are, your body is bound. You're sitting at a desk, and this is good, and this very deeply ingrained. I was going to say, kind of go along with that. Before you go into school, we're always told share, 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 share. When we hit the school, it's keep your eye on your paper, don't share your answers, don't come to the person over here. Uh, it's kind of told just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you go to work, you'll be evaluated on teamwork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, fear of taking risks or making mistakes. I, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to raise fear at, at, as a big issue. Underlying fear, underlying everything. I, I can't even I can't even gauge how how okay. comprehensive it is. Yes, that is. That is one of the big ones. Because how do you make somebody do something that they don't want to do? Like, what, is, what do we mean when you say, well, you know, the teacher made me do it? Um, or somebody made me do it? Like, what does that really mean? Because it's tied up in fear, and, it's, and if school is about anything, if you read the historical stuff that, that, that Gatto and other people write, you know, that, that school developed basically in order to train people from a young age to do things that they didn't want to do. Because nobody wanted to work on an assembly line for 12 hours a day or you know, add up columns of figures like industrial revolution clerks had to do. You know. No one wanted to do that kind of work, if, if, especially if they had been a, a, a farmer or a craftsperson doing general things that were, that were creative and, and interesting. No one wanted to do that, and so people had bad work habits, and so they said, well, we're going to have to train people from a young age to do things for external rewards that they don't actually want to do, that are tedious and degrading, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Most, most people probably understand that, that narrative of how school um, developed in the Industrial Revolution as part and parcel of that enterprise um, to break the spirit to do things that um, are of the machine. So. How do you make somebody do something? Well, if, if, if someone is pointing a gun to my head and says, you know, do, do that, then I could, I could rightly say that they made me do that. Because if I didn't do it, they would kill me. I mean, in some sense, maybe I, even then, they can't make me do it. But said, yeah, you always do it because you decide to do it. No one can make you do anything. Like, at the end of the day, if someone has a gun to your head, you still made the choice. That's right. Right. And, and, and that's really important because on a deep level, to free ourselves from the habits of school, which are the habits of civilization, we need to no longer be afraid to die. We have to, we have to at some point, and this will happen to everybody, you'll come to some point in your life where you say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it is. Um, I'm going to, and it could be something, you know, I'm going to quit this job. I'm going to start this school. I'm going to jump out into this endeavor, which is risky. And I'm going to do it no matter what, even though I'm going to lose my health insurance, even though I'm going to take a cut in income, even though I might not be able to pay my mortgage, even though all of these scary things come up. And basically you're saying it's more important to live right than it is to stay alive. Life is more important than survival, is another way to put it, to be fully alive and fully human and to be here for the purpose that you are here for. And so at some point, 
in this de-schooling process, you come up against fear of what is going to happen. This is instilled in us in school when they say, you know, you better do your homework and get good grades or it's going to go on your permanent record. I mean, this is what I got in 10th grade, you know, this is, this is for real now, you know, in 7th and 8th grade that wasn't on your permanent record, but now colleges are going to be looking, about, looking at this, they're going to look at your GPA, and if you don't go to good college, you're not going to get a good job, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, you start early, and then in 7th grade you were, they were already saying, you know, we're not going to coddle you like you did in, like we did in elementary school. You know, this is going to determine whether you get into the AP classes in, in, in high school. I mean, this, this uh, inculcating of fear goes back very far. So living in fear is a habit of school. One way, <laughs> a lot of stuff's coming through here. Um, and I, I, I just want to just finish off this thought and then I'm, we'll have more comments. One way to, no, actually I will invite comments now and then I'll give you the second part soon. Um, yeah, the whole conversation seems to be focused. If you ever, if you ever wrote the book, it's all the wisdom of insecurity by Alan Collins. And he sort of talks about the creation of security and success as an educational method to create security. Yeah. Talk louder so we can pick it up on the. Sorry. Um, the idea of promoting security and the fear that results from not achieving that security and success. Yeah. Um, if you don't go to college, you know you'll, you'll never get a job. Or right. Goes on. Right. Yeah. Alan Watts um, had some insights about that. And so what you do is you take away this primal security, then you give back a conditional security and threaten to take it away um, in order to control somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You first and then, and then you. One thought that was coming back again and again in my mind was that what, what takes away fear is understanding things. When you understand the thing you fear, that's when you stop fearing it. And you mm -hmm. get into that fear. Now, uh, the discourse we were having on what schooling does, I, I came in a little late, I don't know if you've covered this already. I think there's an overemphasis on scientific ways of looking at life. Mm -hmm. That X builds up to Y, builds up to Z, and so on. And this, this progression, which, which is sort of inbuilt into our thinking processes, sort of prevents us from actually addressing the problem or the thing that we're fearing because life is not X leading to Y leading to Z. It's, there are so many different angles to it. So right. this, this thing that we call scientific thought, 2 plus 2 is always 4, I think that has a very important uh, structural function in making us think the way we do think. And I, I don't think that is really scientific. I mean, if, if that's what science was, then Einstein would never have discovered any of the things that he did. Because right. All that any scientist does is goes away from the lateral pattern of way of thinking. Yeah. And I think that's that's something which we need to learn ourselves first, and then teach yep. the kids that thinking is not just building upon a line. That yeah, that that is related to some of the things we were talking about. Um, but one thing that that. Um, that reminds me of, and maybe it's the same thing that you're saying, is, is that in, sc <laughs> in school one of the things that we learn is that you have to start with the elements, the basics, the fundamentals, and you build up from that. So in order to learn organic chemistry, first you have to learn, you know, about uh, electron valences, you know, and then you have to, and you build it up into bigger and bigger molecules. Um, and if you want to learn physics, if you want to learn you know, Einsteinian physics, first you have to learn, you know, the equations for force, you know, and for acceleration, and you build up from that. But, but as a matter of fact, that's not actually how people learn. Usually you start with the higher level questions, and then you say, okay, now in order to understand this, then you go lower and lower and lower, and you get to the elements um, from these higher level questions, and that's historically how it evolved too. You know, people didn't start with the basics, and um, 
one effect of, and as so many textbooks say elements of this, elements of that, elements of algebra, elements of, of political theory. Um, and one of the effects, though, of, of doing it from the, t from the bottom up and, like you said, to try to build knowledge is that knowledge and learning is very boring at the base level. It's very boring. And the real questions, the real, the real interesting stuff is inaccessible to anyone who hasn't gone through this really long process. So knowledge becomes a realm of experts. And that feeds into the, another of the things, the unconscious habits of schooling. Well, if, it, if, that, if that's the case, then the experts will have to tell me what's true. Alienation from learning. Mm -hmm. so yeah, alienation from learning. Knowledge is established and fixed. Yes. And you just learn about what other people think. You're right. And, and perhaps you can, if you build up from these basic building blocks and finally finish grad school, then you too can be in the rarefied realm of real science and real knowledge, and you can make an infinitesimal contribution to it. In, uh, in, in thinking about this, I've been kind of like running um, like a chicken and egg kind of question in my head because I'm, I'm feeling like I can't just jump and say that like the source of all these habits are is in fact school and I think it's like reductive to say like there's some sort of time before or there's something like that because you, you mentioned it you said these are like the habits of civilization so uh, for me like in recognizing these things in myself and having gone through public school and trying to understand what it, these things are in myself, but then also seeing them in other aspects of the world and in offices and in, you know, situations that don't even have anything to do with school. I wonder, you know, I just want to throw that question out in terms of what is it about maybe the human condition or human, you know, beings that, that leads us towards these, these types of things. So I think like with Alan Watson, kind of the wisdom of insecurity, there's something about a yearning that people have towards fixed and secure and it's so much easier to have somebody telling you what your structure of your day is or telling you know like that and so if we're talking about because we're you know talking framing this in the, in the sense of de-schooling ourselves basically so yeah what we're talking about is then the schooling civilization but we live in civilization so how does that right. you know how do we put that this out is... there and, and that's a big like that's the question I just run in my through my head I'm like I, I see a lot of you know, reason why all these things exist in school or why they perpetuate and things like that. So how do we even begin to de-school ourselves if civilization in itself, and I mean, I don't know, we don't have any really record of, of you know, what primitive man's social structures were like, so it's hard to, hard to just imagine what it was, that there was some time when it wasn't existent. Okay, this is, this is completely what my book is about. My book is called The Ascent of Humanity. It's a semi-ironic title. Um, and, but that's the question that, that, I've, that I spent half my adult life thinking about. The um, answer that I came to that was satisfying for me is, is that the origin of all of this stuff is as deep as it could possibly be. It's the human sense of self. All of this comes from a belief and a felt experience that to be well, let's do it actually. Here. Do a, let's do a little experiment, okay? Um, close your eyes, and I would like you to make a picture of yourself doing nothing but simply being. And I want you to experience yourself as just being. I want you to make a picture of yourself doing nothing but being, but existing. What does that look like to just exist? Okay, open your eyes. In the second part, we'll do a felt experience of just being <coughs> to show why the picture that most people have of just being is a trick that's been perpetrated on us. How many people imagine yourself alone? Imagine yourself, your picture of you just being was a picture of you alone. Okay. Most people imagine themselves alone. If I say, well, do, you know, imagine yourself doing nothing but just existing. What are you doing right now? Being. 
Yeah, you are, and you're not alone. But, it, but, but you could say, well, you're, you're in a seminar, right? Or you're talking to somebody, so you're not just being. That's, that's, I don't believe that logic, but I'm saying that that's what someone might say. Right? Someone might say, say that, you know, if you're not intera like, interacting with somebody, that's not just being. But there's this pure state of existence. So to be is to be alone. So at the foundation of, of our civilization and of our educational system, both, is a human sense of self that is separate and, and discreet. Like, like, starts and ends here. It's what Alan Watts called the skin encapsulated ego. It's what biology calls the uh, phenotype, the expression of the nuclear DNA. It's what uh, religion would call something like the, the soul encased in flesh and separate from other souls. It's what economics calls the, the, the economic man, the rational actor. Okay, and so in all of these systems you have these separate units that have relationships and interact, but they're fundamentally separate. Um, ancient people did not think this way. And Stone Age people, tribal people to this day, don't really think this way. To be, to them, is to relate. And if you strip away your relationships, you are less. That's what's happened through our ideology and partly through our schooling is that our connected self has been truncated and we've been made small. This creates a very painful wound, which is why it hurts just to be a state which we call boredom, which is a new state. Um, indigenous people did not have a word for boredom because it didn't exist for them. They were happy to literally sit and watch the grass grow. And so much comes from this, this separation. Part of it is the ideology of objectivity that were separate from the universe, too. So I'm not going to go too much more into that, but um, if you want to... What? When you asked me to do that, yes. I think of myself doing nothing as being. Yeah. The interesting thing happened. I could not think of my body. Uh -huh. I, I was there. Right. There's some deep metaphysical issues here um, that I won't go into too much except in one small way, which is, will be relevant, although maybe not so much to schooling, but um, there's really two ways to look at it. Like, you could say that, okay, um, the orthodox ideology says that every electron in the universe is identical. That there are many, many, many of them and they're all identical. That every carbon atom in the universe, well, every carbon-12 atom is identical. And every carbon-14 atom is identical and every building block is identical and therefore that we are basically just permutations of the same basic building blocks and we're not fundamentally different. There's nothing unique about us. It's just that we're different mixes of the same stuff. And that's one of the ideologies underneath school, which basically treats people as variations on the same identical template and tries to use, therefore, standard methods to educate us to get a standard result. There are two ways to look at it that are alternatives to this. One, and these both have physics justifications. One is that every electron is unique, which is why when you send them through a diffraction slit, some of them decide to go this way and some decide to go that way and there's no reductionistic reason to explain why. And the animist, the, the tribalist would say, 
it's obvious why one goes this way and one goes that way, because that one chose to go this way and that one chose to go that way, and they each have a uniqueness. They each have a personhood, uh, a sentience. When you apply this to school, then you get everything that this conference is all about. Because fundamentally we say that, that every child is unique and self-determined and has a right to be self-determined. The other way to look at it that's equally true is that there is only one electron. There is only one electron. Every electron is the same electron. Not identical, not separate electrons that are identical, but the same electron coming in and out of existence, looping back through time. And that we are all, therefore, the same being, looking at each other through different eyes. And you can get a felt sense of that. And the, the, the joy and the relief and the connection and the intimacy is so intense that we just have to look away in half a second, either with our eyes or with our mind. Okay, um, I want to, let's see. Can, can I ask, when Dave asked that question, it was running through my mind, and you were talking about, you know, what's this perspective of what people were doing thousands of years ago? It seems that a lot of learning must have come from nature, mm -hmm. right, and watching, and, you know, animals killing each other, and, you know, just this whole idea of, you know, survival of the fittest to some degree. Um, yeah. Helped manifest that fear in one way and help manifest this idea that, you know, you do have to exercise smarts in some way to move forward. Yes, the analytic method and the ego self and the fear-based self does have um, a proper role. I mean, there is, a, there is knowledge that you can gain by taking something apart and dividing it up into little pieces and doing all the things that we do in our educational system. But what's happened is that that particular way of approaching knowledge and approaching being has become, we've over applied it and tried to apply it to everything, um, including things where it does not apply. And that's why categorically rejecting it is itself a habit of schooling, right? It's one of the ones on, on, on this side, if we had maintained that. Um, that, but for those of you who came in late, to reflexively and unthinkingly reject something is just as much a habit of that thing as to unthinkingly accept it. And to be free of it is to take it on its own merits and use it appropriately. Um, so is there, I want to, um, I have another, okay, I, I think I'll, I'll conclude this hour with one more observation about fear. Because I asked the question, how do you make somebody do something? And talked about putting a gun to your head. The greatest fear, the greatest fear of any, any young mammal is abandonment. It's a death sentence for a young mammal who's nursing. So when we, if you want to control a child, the most powerful way is to tap into the fear of abandonment, which is the fear of death. And the way to do that is through conditional acceptance and rejection. Acceptance says, I won't abandon you, you're here. Rejection says, I might abandon you. You're on thin ice, and if you keep doing this, you know, I'm gonna push you out of the nest. I think birds have the same fear. Um, <laughs> And so this, this is how parents control their kids, and this is how teachers in schools control children too. The grades and, and red stars and check marks and all of this, these are emblems of acceptance and rejection, and they tap into the primal fear of a young mammal. And then we internalize it as guilt and shame. The label of good, I was a good boy today, or bad, what's wrong with you? This is the internalized program of control that we learn through our, through our, being, through our childhood and through, and through school. And it doesn't work. We think it works. And we think that when it doesn't work, we have to do it even more. So for example, if you try to go on a diet and you, you're really good and you say, you know, I'm gonna stay on my diet, I'm gonna be really good, and so you're giving yourself these pats on the back and a day, two days, you're on the diet, and then finally, it's not strong enough, and you can't do it anymore, and you eat everything in the house. And then the 
uh, rejection part comes in. Why did I do that? What's wrong with me? Uh, 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 hitting yourself, right? Beating yourself up. And it doesn't have to be a diet. It could be, you know, I'm not going to yell at my kids anymore. And how could I have done that? I'm so bad, right? So this, this internalized punishment and reward system. It's all going back to the greatest fear of any young mammal. But it doesn't work because essentially to control somebody by threatening their life is nothing more, nothing less than slavery. And we're not meant to be slaves. We are noble, divine beings and we're not meant to be slaves. And the response of any slave is to rebel. And so that's called a binge when it comes to diet or an outbreak when it, or an outburst when it comes to some other area because we're not meant to be slaves. And this is, but these habits of self-control, this use of fear encoded as acceptance and rejection. This is another habit of school. The habit of constantly evaluating yourself. Was I a good boy? Was I a good girl today? And we think that we're going to be, be kinder to the planet by imposing this even more generally and more intensively. This huge effort to be good. And it doesn't work. So, in the next, now we have a part two here at uh, three o'clock. And I'd like part two to, what I, what I would like to set up for part two is that everybody goes out in the next few hours, lunch, conversation, another seminar, one something, okay? And just to observe yourself and see if, if any of this discussion has brought to light a habit of school that was unconscious in you before and now has come to light and to watch it operating and just to gather some impressions because I would like to hear how other people are liberating themselves from these habits because that'll help me liberate myself from these habits and we can all help each other. So gather some data, gather some impressions and we'll meet again at three o'clock and we can share with each other the ways that, right, this is the theoretical part, now I want to really get practical. So we'll share with each other how we can actually liberate ourselves and what we've learned from observing ourselves in the next few hours. Okay? So thank you very much. Yeah. A lot of people who were here last time are not, which is to be expected because there's lots else to do, but some people here weren't here for the first part too. So I want to just kind of figure out how many, how many people are in that category so I know how much to... Okay, the category of you were not here for part one. All right, quite a number of you. Okay, good. Um, all right, so basically one of the things we did uh, in the first hour was to make a list of the unconscious or conscious or just the habits of school. And I pointed out that they're not habits just of school, they're of our whole civilization. And in a lot of ways they're intensified in school, but even if you didn't go to a normal school, these habits still might be present in your thinking and your habits, your way of, your way of being. And we, so when we, when we, um, when the first part ended, um, I invited you to spend the next three hours while you have lunch and get into conversations and maybe go to another seminar um, to kind of observe yourself to see if you can notice any of these habits in operation, especially a habit that was unconscious to begin with but might have become conscious. Um, since there's so many of you who weren't here for the beginning, um, I'm just going to say a, give a few examples of these habits and there's basically you can think of them as, as being of two different types. There's habits of submission and habits of defiance. The habits and, sub, submission and, and, and defiance. defiance. Right. For example, a habit of submission would be to be punctual, to be on time all the time, and that's something we learned how to do in school, among other places. A habit of defiance would be to be never on time, to flaunt being late, and to procrastinate. Um, procrastination is also, you could contrast that with the habit of always doing as you're told when you're told to do it. To reflexively reject anything you're told is just as much a habit of school 
as it is to do everything you're told. The habit of looking outside yourself, looking to authority for answers is definitely a habit of school. Another habit of school would be to reject, automatically reject anything that comes from authority. To reject authority just because it's authority. So I, I noticed that at, a, at this conference there's a lot of people who are, have the habits of defiance, which is probably a necessary stage in liberating ourselves entirely from the habits of school, and then we can be free. Well, I did the little lunchtime homework assignment as well, and I noticed in myself this, this habit of always wondering if something is allowed, if something's permitted. Is it allowed to do this? Is it allowed to do that? And so, on the, and in some ways, I've rejected consciously these conventions. And so, my, my, so I have both a habit of submission and a habit of defiance in this area. My habit of submission is to be very tentative and very obedient and to only do what is expected, what is conventionally permitted. Um, for example, in a situation like this. My habit of defiance would be to just flaunt convention to act in unconventional ways just because it's unconventional, to refuse to shave maybe, to refuse to wear nice clothes just because I'm not going to do it, you know, fuck you, that kind of thing. Like that's a habit of school, saying, you know, fuck you to the teacher, right? That's just as much as to say yes sir to the teacher. Okay, and so I noticed while I was thinking about how to prepare for this part, that was one of the things that I noticed operating in myself. Another big habit, just to also get people thinking, another major habit, one of the most powerful of school is to want to be seen as smart and right to impress teacher. The habits of school get internalized. Uh, initially it's to impress teacher and then in the future, it's to impress everyone around you and also to impress yourself, to give yourself credit and to give yourself a good grade. We also, in the first part, related it to fear, the habit of always being in fear and living in fear. And the origin of this fear in conditional approval and rejection, which is really survival anxiety. How, how Modern parenting, and especially modern schooling, uses this to control and manipulate people. And then when we internalize it as guilt and shame, how we use it to control and manipulate ourselves. So de-schooling is about liberating ourselves more, just, more than just from school, but also from these broader programs of control and ultimately the war against the self and the war against nature and the war against human nature that lies at the basis of our civilization. I'm not going to talk about that too much more right now, because um, I'd like to just open it up now um, to hear other people's reflections on their own unconscious habits, because you know, like we're all in a different place, and it really is helpful just for me personally to hear what other people have discovered in this process of de-schooling themselves, because then sometimes like, oh yeah, I do that, you know, and, and wow, and maybe I can stop doing that. How to stop, once you've realized it, is something I'll go into in the, later on in this hour. So, um, and while we do this, I'm going to pass around this. If you want to be on my email list when I announce like publications and events and things, just write your name and your email address very clearly. Um, so. Would anybody like to, yeah? If, if you're already on the list, do you have to put it on the mailing list? No, if you're already on my mailing list, don't put your name on. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I, I'm really curious to hear what you think is, it seems like there's the uh, rebelling or submission, <coughs> pretty much. What about a third option of acknowledging some kind of self-identity and going in harmony with that rather than being against something mm -hmm. or... Yeah, I would say that that would be 
that wouldn't be a habit of schooling. I mean, that would be transcending a habit of schooling. How so? Because I feel like you're looking in terrier to explore that. I mean, certainly using the reflection of the exterior, but it's not something that I would say I would learn in school. Maybe No, no, no. No, it's not something you learn how to do, but it's, I mean, to me that would be like, to, that would be coming to terms with what has been unconsciously drilled into you through your schooling and no longer being subject to it. Unless I'm not, maybe I'm completely not understanding what you're saying. Would, does someone else really get what he's saying and can explain it? Nobody gets me. I kind of get it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, because sure. I kind of have, it, it's the extremism of it's got to be either a negative or a positive almost, and it's like finding... Like, yeah. Or a negative and a negative. Yeah, I think it seems like a negative and a negative. Either you're being brainwashed or you're rebelling against. Well, it's pretty much like there's, there's, I mean, conditioning just happens in any way, shape, and form. So it's always happening, regardless of what path you choose, unless you have the answer to this, which I haven't read your book. <laughs> and I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, but, you know, you know, how do you... How do, you, how do you avoid conditioning, I guess, is by, can you avoid it by, you know, finding an inner peace of just trusting your own self and pulling on your own resources? That's kind of what I was thinking. Thought you were yeah, doing. yeah, that's all along okay. the line. Okay, Anna, do you want to? Well, I think that, like, what I got from what you were saying is that it's, at least my own take on it is that, you know, everything, we're all influenced by everything, and school is such a large part of many people's you know, formative years, that it is, all, it is also a large influence. But the reality is we're always influenced by everything, and it's not about bad or good, it's about being able to kind of remove the layers, examine them, and say, ooh, do I want this or do I not want this? You right. know? And I think that it's, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, it's not necessarily, you know, school is bad. But anyway, can I give an example of de-schooling myself? Yeah. Because I uh, dropped out of school when I was 14, I'm 17 now. And um, the, the biggest thing that I went through that I had to get rid of um, was the, this idea that, um, that, if, that I had to be with people, kids my own age, with peers, all the time, every day, or else I was unsocial, I wasn't cool. Um, and I, I would get, you know, it was, it was the parents and it was the TV and it was everything saying, teenagers are social creatures and if you're not social, there's something wrong with you. Um, and I had to, I, I found out that I was actually, I consider myself an introvert and I enjoy spending time alone, and I wasn't lonely, but I thought I should be lonely because that's what everyone seemed to be telling me. Um, because everyone says, well, what about the social life, and what about this? And, and it seemed that it was, it was the process of removing agendas from other people, and school is, uh, can be a very large, one big agenda, just like a, other you know, workspaces and everything like that. Um, and, and the way that I was able to come to peace with it, with it was I discovered the word yes, which is such a simple word, but it's my favorite word in the entire, in any language, because I realized that, that when you're fighting with something, sometimes all it takes is a yes. That sounds so simple, but, but um, yes to my flaws, yes to my strengths, yes to this layer and yes to that layer, and it becomes a beautiful, and you can you know, express it in artwork, and, it, and I'm kind of jumbling up my thoughts here because I'm still trying to articulate it, but um, I found that these schooling sometimes can be really stressful if you put the stress on yourself, but it can also be a really wonderful experience of exploration and like um, being with yourself and um, coming and saying yes to, your, to yourself as you are with all the layers of influence and without the layers of influence. Mm -hmm. so, uh, one sec. Is, is what Matthew is asking, is, is, are you asking whether it's possible to not get into this? Or are you asking well, um, are we not getting into no, I don't, think, I don't think that that's possible. However, I do feel like after you have a lot of influence, certainly you're always going to have this influence, but when you're a child, you're more susceptible to this influence because everything is a stimulus. Everything is always a stimulus. However, when you have a more independent focus on you as a self-actualized individual, you can ascribe more faith to your interior concept of identity where you can have these experiences however they get filtered through, and they always do, but when we're younger and we're, we have less of a degree of identity, then there's, there's more of an 
exterior influence than there is an interior influence. And once we matriculate into this realm of some kind of strong self-identity, then we are doing less of a submission or an acquiescence as much as we are a volitional movement. Well, I, I think that, okay, I'm not sure how much, how too deeply I want to get into this particular conversation. I think a lot of what we think of as volitional is actually just the internalization of external control and that we're not, we don't have as much free will okay. and as we think. I want to learn about that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. But also, the other thing that, that was coming up for me as you spoke was that just because something's a habit of school doesn't mean it's bad. You know, it might be something that serves us very well. And we might examine it and say, yeah, you know, I want to keep that habit. So it's not about re categorically rejecting everything that comes from school, um, which in itself might be a habit of school to say, okay, everything's either right or wrong, um, as answers are on tests. And that's one of the habits that I like to let go of that um, doesn't serve me very well anymore. Um, the habit of labeling, labeling everything right and wrong and having to come to a judgment about everything um, instead of sometimes perhaps just to feel something and withhold offering to myself a judgment or an analysis. Somebody, I want to have somebody speak who is ordinarily shy about speaking but has something really valuable. Would anybody like to take advantage of that invitation. Is that you? I think so. At this point, I, you go up and down. It's a roller coaster. Uh, I just wanted to say to what you were saying that I think there's a, a way of bringing together all these things that I call reconciliation. When you reconcile apparent opposites, then you move forward, you create something completely new, which is yours. Yeah. Kind of like a sailboat. You know, a sailboat has the resistance of the water and of its own inertia, but the wind wants to move it. But then you have the, uh, what do you call it, the sail and the, what do you call it? the rudder and all of that stuff. And if you reconcile these two apparent opposite forces, you can get it to go in any direction, including almost into the wind. So if, if you can take, you know, that the submission, the defiance, and all of that, reconcile them some kind of way, then they become yours. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Kathy, you were going to, you had a comment too. I was just going to give you an example. Of Thank you. Time. Yeah. Um, I ended up having lunch with somebody who um, was in one of the workshops. Um, and um, we got into a school discussion, and at one point I offered, um, we were, it, it just felt like a, a back and forth in terms of what we were talking about felt like we were both on the same page. And then I offered a piece of information that I, I realized um, didn't sit well with him. Or, or he just didn't respond in the same way, like, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I realized, and, but, but what came up for me was, oh, that was wrong. I did a mm. wrong thing. And here we were having a nice conversation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so then I thought about it afterwards, and I thought, it didn't resonate with him. Yeah. So that wasn't right. That wasn't wrong. But, but I, ha I really had this deep feeling of, oh, it's wrong. I, yes. I lost this connection with him that we were having this nice connection. Right. And then we went on to something else and we talked about something that seemed like we're on the same page again. But so the habit would... Why we would have to always be on the same page about things? Mm -hmm. it's like, that could be a habit of school. Things, right? Yeah, a habit of school would be um, w wanting approval from your peer group or wanting approval from whatever authority is there. Yeah, so definitely a habit of schooling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Khalif. Um, when I got here, I realized that even though I didn't do the assignment, I, actually a, a habit of school played out right here in my seat as I was thinking about the fact that I hadn't done the assignment. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, should I kind of reverse engineer a response to this and think about happen and try to come up with it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should, you know, what would people think if I don't have mm -hmm. an example that shows that I was studious and attentive to this. Right. So, <laughs> For me, one thing that, you know, even giving an assignment is something that, that I have to overcome some resistance because my extreme reaction to the control of school was to, oh, I'm not ever going to give anyone an assignment, you know, and, and 
end or impose my will upon a group, you know, and set a direction and stuff, you know, I'm going to be democratic and everything. Um, and now I'm, I'm coming back to m maybe more of a, I wouldn't say balanced, I'd say free, you know, where I, where I feel free to, to do what I want to do. Being free to do what you want, I mean, that's one of the really deep things that school teaches you against, you know, that, that you can't just do what you want. Yeah? Teacher, that's one of the things, one of the things that, uh, you know, you better do, what am I going to, what am I going to say? Um, during lunch, I was thinking, what's going on? And we, we, I was in a discussion with a couple of people, and I said, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. And I, you know, like, that's still, like, really a big question every day. It's like, I'm doing some stuff, but is this really what I want to do? What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really was taught mm -hmm. not to. Not to figure that out, but to just keep following until I got to the end of then, then what, now what? Although I would say that, that the idea of you've got to figure out what you want to do when you grow up is also an ideology of school, if not a habit of school. Like, since when does anybody who does what they love actually figure it out? Figure it out, think of that phrase, that, that figure of speech, to figure out. What it really means is that you're going to add up, you're going to quantify things, you're going to add up all the numbers, and you're going to literally figure out through analysis and logic what you're going to do. Where'd that come from? There are books about it. Yeah, you know, you're supposed to weight everything. Here's how to make a decision. You, you assign a number value to all of the pros and cons, and you add them up. And whatever option has the highest pros and the least cons, in, in government it's called a cost-benefit analysis. And that's really making choices from the mind instead of from the heart, which says, I don't care what the cost-benefit analysis says, I just know it's wrong to cut down this forest and I'm not going to do it no matter what. That's not something we learn in school, to trust our instincts. We learn to trust these abstractions. So that could be a, another habit of school, um, trusting in abstractions. And what I was talking about the first time um, about principles, living according to principles. Um, again, that's something that's coded very deeply in in our pedagogy. Any other? Yeah, Regina. Somebody was talking about um, you. You were talking about doing what you want to do. And one of the things that I am working on in my de schooling of myself process is uh, thinking about my needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was taught that they don't matter or if I was not taught that they do matter, but I'm working on identifying what is a need versus a want and what's the relationship yeah. between what I want and what I need. Uh huh. Yeah, it's 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 fairly acceptable to say I'm going to learn to meet my needs and what my needs are. It's a little less acceptable to say I'm going to learn to meet my wants. Yeah. And I'm going to really indulge those. Yeah, and I don't know if I'm even there yet. I'm yeah. working on finding out what's a need and do I want what I need? Is that why I want it, or do I want it for some other reason? I have another seminar that that delves into this in a lot of depth, but basically. Um, the basic principle is that wants come from unmet needs and that it feels good to meet your needs and that an unmet need hurts. Really simple. That's why if you hold your breath for a minute, it hurts and then when you breathe it feels good. Very basic. Um, but that's a little off topic. Um, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, it has to do with uh, ego and like, measuring myself. So I think there's like this calculator that's constant, like a cash register that's sort of always in the background operating, like like in the background of your computer, saying that, well, I have more of something than he has, or, mm -hmm. he has, or less of something than he has. Or she. Yeah. And I don't know if that just comes from school or, you know, somewhere else, but this trouble. And I try to, I think in, it's like a, a kind of mindfulness to try to just, Notice that and observe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. This is, uh, yeah. I just came from a session where I realized I was one of the few people who did not speak, which is not like me. And then I also said, well, that doesn't look right if I don't say something. Mm. You anticipate, you should mm -hmm. contribute. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard for us to, to, to grok the. The, the, the 
depth, I mean, how impactful it is to be in a setting where you're always being evaluated. That's, you know, the teacher's there, and the teacher's going to give you a grade which you associate with your, your, your future success in life, you know, and, and anything could be part of that grade. So you're, you're always on display, you know, you're always performing. That is such a, a burden, you know, and, and it gets so deeply ingrained. Basically, what we're talking about, what you were saying right now, what you're saying, and I'm basically resurrecting what we have briefly discussed in the previous session, is not so much about de schooling as it is about maybe de socializing. Yeah. A better word. Yep. I mean, school is just one of the devices which right. acts for a particular function that society has. Yes. And yep. so it's not just mm -hmm. It starts with the way the mother feels about the child in her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's where it starts. Yep, it's part of de decivilizing ourselves. I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but definitely yeah. it's much bigger than school. And school can't change without changing everything else. It's, it's impossible to change one thing without changing everything. Yeah, school is just representing that whole society. Right. Yep. Yes. Anna? Well, I was going to add on to that because I was having trouble with your language and I just wanted, I felt like I needed to say something, but mm -hmm. um, I think that it, it, I, I really struggle at things like this because there's so much anti-school talk um, and it's hard. I don't know. I, I guess um, I, I wish we could make that distinction in the language just because I've had good experiences at schools and some other people have had good experiences at schools and I think that it can't be that black and white, and talking about it that black and white doesn't feel right to me, and I don't know if there's another way that we can address it, but it's not, I, I think it, it's a really good point, it's not simply de-schooling, it's de, um, it's, it's true, it's finding truth within ourselves and, um, you know, um, doing what's right for us as opposed to all the influences of other people. So it's more, it seems like it's more about, you know, um, connecting with what we want and who we are and our needs and how we can meet those needs mm -hmm. um, and remove the, the, the external influences that we don't want. Influence yeah. is not a bad thing. That's right. right. Bad you, could, thing. you could imagine, that's I mean, I can imagine, yeah, and that's what you're saying. I can imagine and I do imagine um, situations, I mean, what is a school anyway, right? But so situations where adults and children are interacting and the purpose is exactly what Anna was saying, the purpose of these interactions is like consciously to um, create situations where people can come in contact with their needs, where children can learn what their needs are, what their wants are, what their passion is, who they really are in this world, and then have the resources and opportunities to express and enact those discoveries. And you could call that a school, and it would be a beautiful thing. And to some extent, you can find this in school already. In you can find this in the worst public school in the country. There is still a tiny little, because everything that's negative and harmful and destructive in our civilization also has a spark of spirit, a spark of, of a beautiful spirit and the seed of a more beautiful world. And there's, any school you go to, there's committed teachers who really love kids and who really want what's best for them and within even the worst teacher there is that tiny little spark of that desire too. I think it's important to see that, to see the beauty in all things that's there at least in a, in a germinal form and to speak to that. Like Gandhi said, he said speak to their reason, reason and conscience. See somebody as, you know, I know you really want to do the most beautiful thing and maybe you, you think that you can't, maybe it feels impossible, maybe you're afraid to, but, and you don't necessarily say that out loud, right, but you see people with, with those eyes, and that <coughs> creates a space where it can begin to blossom and someone will, will maybe make that choice. So I, I agree not to, not to um, categorically demonize school, and it is just a word.
Yeah. Is there a better word we could use, like a replacement word? I don't know if anyone else feels. I know you want to say. No, because then you keep going from one word to another, and you get into this PC I kind know, of. I yeah. know. I know. I don't want to make it too PC. I'm just wondering. We'll have a metaphorical asterisk next to. It. Yeah. So. Okay. I see it as as ending, <clears throat> as really ending the war against the self. School is part of the age of separate school as we know it is part of the age of separation, the age of control, the age of, of the war against nature, the war against nature and the war against human nature. You can really trace its origins back to agriculture, back to domestication, and symbolic culture. These are what began the distancing process from nature, where we began to see nature as an other and began to distinguish between good and, and, and evil. Um, you know, with agriculture, for example, the, all of a sudden, instead of this, this unbroken, harmonious system of nature, all of a sudden the wolf is bad and the, and the cow is good. The, 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 the weed is bad and the, the vegetable is good and you begin to distinguish. And then you have good weather and bad weather and... and is that not natural though? Is what not natural? To think of things as good and bad. I mean, certainly the antelope thinks as the jaguar is bad. Not necessarily. Maybe he just thinks of him as dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It not necessarily bad. I mean, even now, if you go to tribal communities, they don't consider a stormy sky as, a, as bad weather. They just yeah. consider it as weather. Yeah. It's not the fault of weather. Right. Just, they're not dependent in any way with that weather. Happens. But they are. I mean, sometimes. If you have crops, like, I think then you have a drought. Yeah. But when you're having crops, mm -hmm. you have to have a particular pattern to your life, to your weather, to everything. You need to be able to control the weather, which you can't. So you control your systems according to what right. you know the weather to be like. But in a tribal situation, you don't need to do that. You go with the flow. If it's a pre-agricultural tribe, yes. Yeah. And, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is a huge topic, okay? Mm -hmm. This, yeah. The, the, it's in the ascent of humanity, it's, and that chapter is like 80 pages. I mean, it's the origins of separation, it's called. But really what I was saying is that, is that school is just one expression of the ordering and management and domination of nature. Because it says, you know, and I'm again talking about school as as it's, as it's normally practiced today. Um, but it says, you know, we cannot accept the unmolded child. Um, nature, the, na the child's natural impulses must be overcome. We have to teach children to overcome their natural impulses. So we set up this, this system of controls and rewards and punishments. And you will develop good work habits and good study habits and after you've done all your homework, then you can go out and play, but only after. And, you know, when I was in fourth grade, my, I complained to my math teacher that long division was boring. Um, I'd actually invented long division in third grade, but they told me I couldn't do that yet. And then, so my parents took up the issue, had a meeting with the teacher, and the long and short of it was that she said, if he's bored with this long division, because I, I didn't do page after page of it, you know, same thing again and again. She said, that's good. It's good that he's bored because he's going to be bored a lot in life. And this is preparation for it. And it's really just the overcoming of, of certain parts of the human spirit, of, of validating things because they're hard. Here's another habit. Validating things because they're hard. If I said, you know, it would have been, would have been really easy for me just to give that guy the finger but I didn't do it. I'm congratulating myself on not doing the easy thing. Easy equals bad, hard equals good. That's an ideology of school that's never said out loud. And it is very, very pervasive. You'll probably notice yourself saying, it would have been really easy, or it's just easy to do such and such as a synonym for bad. Well, isn't there some relation though to challenging versus yeah. Hard and so, but isn't there worth in challenge and self-challenge and then mm -hmm. feeling proud that you've overcome challenge? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I think the language is the issue where yeah. it's like the good and the bad and how people perceive those things. Like, because everything, like you're talking about the storm and stuff, like everything has like a balance and there are things that go wrong, but going wrong doesn't make it necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think like that's where mm -hmm. Charlie's at, like the good 
good and the bad and how people perceive good and bad because essentially there is no good and bad. Everything is is and you a lot of it is in language. A lot of times when people use hard to refer to challenge, what they really mean is scary. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe just also the distinction that I'm saying that the people making consciousness versus unconscious challenge or choice versus no choice. And in school, you know, when you're already not thinking or feeling anymore, none of it is, you're not even in awareness of it. You're not even a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes with that wonderful fresh mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that this um, that this workshop, the seminar, is really about is simply to make things that were unconscious conscious. That in itself creates movement and creates change, because a lot of times people will say, "Okay." Now, I've, I've, I've noticed some ways that I've been unconsciously enacting the habits of school. Now, what can I do about it? I've got to do something about this. And I've got to stop doing this. And it can set up this struggle, which is usually unnecessary. Usually, simply becoming aware of something already causes a change. And you'll find yourself acting in different ways automatically and effortlessly without struggle. Anyone else like to share a, yeah? Uh, I'm curious to hear what you think about this. <clears throat> it kind of goes back to the figuring things out and assigning values and whatnot, but I was talking to um, a kind of high-ranking military guy, <clears throat> and he was in charge of sending people in certain spots to go into battle, and I was just knocked, blown away by that responsibility. Mm -hmm. said, you know, how do you, determine how you do things and the responsibility inherent in the decisions that you make. And he says, I take all that information that I have accessible and I use my mind and make up a decision and then I listen to my heart and see how I feel and then I go with my gut. Hmm. And I was wondering where the gut comes into this. Hmm. Wow. No, that rings true to me. There's something about that that rings true to me. Where the gut comes in, that intuition, that inner feeling that says, maybe my heart says this and my mind says this, but I'm going to go this way instead. Like my personal way, is it always exists, like most of the time you just snuff it out with your heart or your mind, and like you use those as something to cover up your gut feeling? Because typically you see them as a Sometimes, certainly, they're in harmony, though. Yeah, the Asian alchemists um, had, had a way to look at this whole thing. They divided the human being into three parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, where the head, symbolized alchemically by silver, was cool, still, and reflective. The, the heart and the lungs, um, symbolized by gold, were warm, and not still, but rhythmic, and um, and they had some other properties too. Uh, and then the gut, symbolized by sulfur, was hot and transformative. And the function of the head in the system was simply to reflect. The function of the heart was to know and to choose. And the function of the gut was to transform, to change. And what, one way to look at what's happened in our civilization is that the functions of the head have invaded everything else, where we try to, uh, it takes the place of the heart in trying to choose and to know when it's really supposed to just reflect and to take over the functions of the, of the gut when we're, when we're trying to act and change from the head. Physiologically, the, the results of this invasion are the stillness of the head invades the rest of the body as tumors, sclerosis, cysts, stones, and other hardenings. And 
sometimes when people let go of control in this mental, mental world, um, these conditions can clear up. Yeah. Okay, I think we, 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 we come into access, we, we come to access deeper and deeper levels of desire. Um, and yes, you can apply it to, like, you can apply the basic, these basic principles of, we're really kind of getting off the track a little bit, but of, of, of basically it's self-trust. And you can apply it to your, your job as an accountant for a Fortune 500 company. Um, and over time, what, you will, what will happen is that the things that you were passionate about and that felt right to you no longer feel right. And when you get into a habit of trusting those feelings and being courageous about acting on them, that, that's a new habit, then eventually it'll come to the point where, where you'll be like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Because you trust yourself deeply enough and you've seen the results of it before. So it doesn't have to be this heroic thing um, where whether it's, you know, you, you might see like your whole life, your whole profession as your whole way of, 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 of being as just like the, the crystallization of what we've been calling the habits of school, which are really the habits of, of, of culture or, or civilization. And oh my God, how am I going to get out of this? My whole life is based on security. My whole life is based on getting a good grade. My whole life is based on pleasing authority, being smart, and being right. What am I going to do about this? How can I get out of this? I want to bust out. And that can seem like an impossible task. Because when you really admit it to yourself, you know, hey, you, know, you might say, I'm, I cannot, I'm afraid to go without health insurance, or to even risk my health insurance, or to even risk my job. And I just can't get there. So. The good news is that this de-schooling process unfolds in a natural progression of stages and that the step to take at any one time, A, it naturally manifests and B, it'll be something on the edge of your courage and not beyond it. If the necessary step is beyond your courage, then what will happen is that you will unconsciously engineer it via some kind of accident, getting fired or some other catastrophe. So you don't have to worry about it. If what is needed is beyond your courage, then you'll take care of it unconsciously. Otherwise, which might be painful, but otherwise, you'll, 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 maybe even tomorrow, you'll have something on the edge of your courage that corresponds to the realizations that you have in this de-schooling process. So, um, Carlos has been persistently raising his hand, so. Uh, going back to the question that was asked about the gut and the heart and all of this other stuff. I don't think we make decisions cognitively. All that cognition can do is get us as much information as possible. Once you get that information, then you've got to go with what I call affective perceptive. The mind has at least three different kinds of process, the cognitive, the affective perceptive, and the pragmatic, practical action to do. Sometimes the affective perceptive, what people call intuition. So let, let's call it intuition to make it easier. Uh, you gather as much information as possible, then you've got to feed that into your intuition, because intuition without information is just berserk. You know, you just do crazy things. But, you know, information or decisions made totally cognitively is, you know, what Charles was saying about, you know, it's a, it's a linear mechanical way of, of just kind of adding it up mathematically and saying this is, but it's not a real decision. The real decision is, fed by the cognition, all the information you can possibly gather up, and then your intuition has to take over. Okay, I'm gonna, I just wanna just halt for a second here, because I'm noticing um, a habit of school that's being invoked, which is, okay, it's basically tell me what to do. Give me the information on it's that the way to do something is to find the information and then to put it into practice, right? Like, like 
there are other ways. In fact, that probably rarely happens that way. But that's one of the habits that we've learned in school. And now we're trying to apply it to personal liberation or something like that. You know, find the information and, and once I understand the information, then I can use it and produce it. I mean, no, that's not what I'm saying. I know it's not what you're saying, but, but, but that's what the information you're providing was feeding into for me. I know you're not, I'm not saying you're advocating yeah. that. But what I'm you saying get information is information anywhere. Yeah. It doesn't have to be from books or whatever. Right. You have to understand. Let, let me put it that way. You have to understand what it is that you're dealing with. Yeah, I'm not actually addressing what you were saying as far as the content was. I was addressing it as far as the um, how it was impacting me and how popular perception of that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I want to stay really focused here. Yeah. I want to address what he said. All right. It's not that way for me. It's the opposite way for me. First, I get the into then I get the information. Okay. I think it a, be normal, but a lot of times, a lot of times, what we think of as reasons are actually rationalizations and justifications for what we want to do anyway. That's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think we're on the same page there. Okay. Is, is anybody? I'd like to hear one more, like something that will really. Um, inspire me that someone has discovered that they that they were unconscious about that now they're conscious about a habit of school or a habit of civilization. Could you make a list of the things that inspire you so that I can? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How to say it so the teacher's impressed because you don't exactly repeat the same words. It's right. according to what you think and you've added a couple of new words and they wow. <laughs> last, year, um, last year I gave kind of a preliminary version of this and I just, there was fewer people so I had people introduce themselves with your name and something that makes you laugh and something that makes you cry. And I said for real, like you know, something that actually has made you laugh and actually has made you cry in the last, whatever, last six months. And many people, though, despite that instruction, still gave this kind of theoretical discourse on what is sad in the world, but didn't actually talk about what actually, didn't actually tell anybody what actually made them cry. And I thought that was an interesting illustration of the habits of school, where you're, you, 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 you don't really get engaged, but you pretend to be engaged, you know. Yeah, bullshitting, that's a good word for it, isn't it? <laughs> I have some kind of realization. Yeah. Um, for the first time, I'm just really thinking about if people that did well in the public school that I went to were in some ways more intelligent or in some ways more able to be molded. Oh, yeah. Definitely, I think it's... I mean, I did very well in public school. You know, I was... Uh, got all kinds of honors and stuff and I went around thinking that I was smarter than everybody else for a long time until I realized that the really smart kids, I mean, to the extent that smart has any utility at all, the really smart kids were the ones who saw through that, maybe even unconsciously. And they didn't waste their time learning the state capitals and they knew, they knew as I did not know, that it doesn't matter what Hernando de Soto did or who the whatever president of the United States was. They knew that it was junk knowledge. They had the intelligence to see through this facade, this lie that, that this is actually useful. And, and I was too stupid. I was, and this is just one version of reality, but I was more easily broken. And I submitted and, you know, again, you get a, a document that says, has submitted, and eventually you get a teaching certificate, which <laughs> the teaching certificate says has submitted and been broken so much that this person can be counted on to break other people and make them submit. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, like. The smartest kids are the ones who drop what the toilet. What turned the light on for me? Um, well, it was a few things. I mean, for one thing, like I kept producing the right answer, sometimes in 600-page format, and I never did get credit 
for it. I never did get my, my rewards that I had unconsciously assumed I would get, you know. And also I just saw other people being more effective in their social relationships, in their work, in, and not just in making money, but in creating the beautiful world that I want to help create, doing wonderful things with their hands and with their minds. And I wasn't doing it. And part of it also, was that I saw that, I mean, I just, I just saw through the whole, the whole motivation of school, the whole motivating program of, when I read Lewis Mumford and, and people like that about just the, about the foundations of civilization and the project to build a tower to heaven the front cover of my book, The Ascent of Humanity, is a painting of the Tower of Babel, a 16th century painting, um, which I see as a, as a metaphor for this attempt to create, well, on the collective level, to create utopia um, by building a human realm that's higher and higher, more and more separate from Earth and from nature. Um, perhaps through the perfection of technology, through the perfection of nanotechnology and computers and the virtual world, and um, through social technologies of, of more and more laws, more and more regulations, more and more um, ways of controlling behavior, social engineering, and then on the, in the personal world, uh, self-perfection, trying harder, um, techniques to motivate yourself and the, and the mythology says that someday you know if you try hard enough and build high enough you will finally reach heaven and this program is falling apart in our time which has to happen the higher you build the more energy is required and the more efforts required even to prevent it from collapsing the sky remains ever as distant you know in the age of coal I mean, this is, and if you read some of the early writings on education too, you know, they were going to build a perfect world. They, they were going to take these, these young minds, you know, and make them into something that their parents could never make them into. They were going to, the, the, the utopian writings from Plato on basically say we're going to take the, the young away from their parents and we're going to educate them scientifically. This is part of creating this perfect world. So even, and, and then, in the material realm too, you know, in the age of coal, they were saying that, that work will soon be obsolete. Now we have machines, and each machine does the work of a thousand men. So in 20 short years, each man will only have to work one thousandth as hard. But what did we get? We got the 16-hour workday instead in the age of coal. Why? Well, we haven't actually built high enough. It's the age of electricity that will usher in technotopia. Oh, actually, no, it's actually atomic power. Um, no, it's the computer. Uh, no, it's nanotechnology, uh, genetic engineering, biomedicine, right? One promise after another. And yet, are we any closer to utopia now? Are people any happier? Is life any more enchanting than it was 50 years ago, 100, 100 1,000 years ago? It's not. The sky is as far away as ever. What's happening in our age is that um, we're in the, in the midst of a convergence of crises as the effort to even maintain the tower and its foundation becomes overwhelming. We can't build any higher. So we have con crises converging in every area, you know, ecological, energy, water, food, medicine, and education. And in the, uh, I, I, what I foresee is that organizations, groups, meetings like this were pioneering new ways of new kinds, not just new technologies, new social technologies, but new kinds of technology that are not based on control, that are not based on the struggle to overcome evil and the war against nature and the war against the self, and that the social and material edifices that we will build will be built for beauty and not height. Because, as a matter of fact, 
another part of the Babel, Babel metaphor is, you know, where does the sky, where is the sky anyway? You know, it's an inch off the ground. It's all around us anyway. It's just a shift of perception away. So the new paradigms of schooling, which we're just beginning to explore. I mean, my kids go to basically a Sudbury type of, of democratic free school, um, which I have some serious issues with. I don't think that it's the have all and end all of, of what a school can be. Same thing with Montessori, same thing with Waldorf. Um, see lots of really beautiful things. I think we're just beginning to figure out what this particular social technology will be in the age of reunion. I call it the age of reunion because here we're in the age of separation that I talked about the first time where, where you know, I talked about how, how school as we know it is an outgrowth of the human sense of self in the modern age where we're separate, discrete beings. I'm separate from you and you're separate from you and we're all separate from the world. And if that is, right, and it's in economics, it's in biology, it's in religion, and if that's what you believe, then essentially we are, are all in competition with each other. More for me is less for you. And that's the basic fact of, of biology, the basic fact of economics that we have to overcome with this conditioning and with the civilizing because we're fundamentally evil. The total depravity of man is the phrase that I like from John Calvin. And so this paradigm of control is a completely natural, unavoidable outgrowth of that sense of self. But that sense of self is collapsing now because the civilization that we've built upon it is collapsing. It's not working anymore, it's not sustainable, and that's becoming more and more obvious. The collapse invades our personal lives as various kinds of catastrophes that are caused by social breakdown, physical breakdown, health breakdown, and ecological breakdown more and more. And these will continue. And in the ruins, amidst the ruins of the old world, based on the old sense of self, the world of separation, the age of reunion will grow. We are already planting the seeds. That's why the work that we're doing in Arrow is so, so important. Because, not, not because we are going to be able to overcome the system that exists right now. But we're planting seeds that will grow. Because when, when, it, when it does, this is just my view, um, that when the educational system collapses, which will be connected to the collapse of everything else, then people will be like, okay, so what do we do now? And there will be pre-existing models that we are trying out right now, that people in this room are trying out. And we'll say, well, this works pretty well, you know, and that works pretty well. It's Waldorf, you know, it's Sudbury, you know, and these things work pretty well. And we'll have, and people are doing this in education, people are doing this in economics, people are doing this in engineering, every realm. Um, the seeds of the new world are, are growing, are, or at least they're ready to germinate. And I guess today we've been talking more about um, the personal level. I think that most people have discovered in their lives that, that real changes do come after a kind of a collapse um, when the old self just isn't working anymore. And conversations like this um, maybe are equivalent to planting the seeds of, you know, even if it doesn't resonate with you or if it's like, well, yeah, that sounds nice, but, you know, come on, like I'm not going to make any real changes now. Um, but they are seeds that, that will, will grow when the time has come. And there's nothing necessarily that you have to do about it right now. Um, let's see, what time is it? Four. It's about four, okay. Um, let's see. What time do you go to? We're supposed to go to four, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the program says. What the program says. Um, I could go on and on like this for a very long time. <laughs> Would somebody like to just, but let's, let's um, okay, here's what I'll do. I, I will continue going on for a while if anyone has anything that they want to just ask and bring up. But, but for those of you who really want to go, you know, I want to respect the, uh, the schedule here. Because after all, <laughs> flaunting 
defiantly flaunting schedules and times. It's just as much a habit of schooling as, as um, unquestioningly abiding by them. So I would like to, to respect people's time. If you want to leave, um, I will, I will uh, call this complete. But I'm going to be hanging out um, basically all night. I'm leaving tomorrow morning.